Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I'm Columbus Rick, the Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of both Himmel and the College Bill Institute. We have uh, an unexpectedly rich and delightful program this afternoon. We have a tradition, both at Himmel and at the College Bill Institute, of having our research fellows or visiting scholars present their work to the local community. And so normally we're treated to a kind of lecture, sometimes with illustrations, by one of these individuals. But I don't recall if we've ever had one where we've had a spouse who seems to be upstaging <laughs> the presentation by the research scholar. So this is, this is delightful. Yes, yes. We first got to know uh, Greg Myers when he was here, I think as a carpenter yes. research fellow, during our summer of displacement at Temple when we were renovating about a year and a half ago. And we uh, quickly warmed to his Apple style and his excitement at finding a number of resources here that were fairly understudied in terms of the larger world of uh, Slavonic manuscript studies and musicology. So we were delighted when he applied for one of our Dietrich Reinhardt fellowships in Eastern Christian manuscript studies and was able to be with us this fall. So Greg is an independent scholar who has a background in historical musicology. He's had fellowships at a number of prestigious institutions, and so Himmel and the College of Institute are something the latest in this series of prestigious <laughs> institutes, both in this country and in Russia and Bulgaria. So we are hearing from somebody who really is involved in a very large international conversation about the significance of musicology and its role in the life of the church. And we're especially delighted then to welcome Anna Levy, who is a native of Bulgaria, who has also uh, studied, performed in Russia, as well as her native Bulgaria, in Switzerland, in Israel, in Canada, now their home, and has frequently appeared also on television in these countries. So we have a star. <laughs> so the title of this lecture might have seemed somewhat esoteric, even to the college Bill crowd, <laughs> had we not had the promise of this um, rich musical dimension. So we're very excited to hear this duet, if we can say that, about the topic between Constantinople and Jerusalem, music and sacred ritual in medieval Slavia Orthodox. Greg and Anna, welcome. Thank you, Father Columba. Dear guests, monastic brethren, colleagues, welcome. I don't know if you may have noticed that, I don't think your ears are playing tricks on you, but uh, just as everybody was, was gathering here, there was some music playing in the background. It was actually the Byzantine chant, a little setting for the portion of Psalm 150 from the morning office. And uh, you'll be hearing more, don't worry. Uh, since there's no, it's, there's no fun in just talking about music. The music is something that you have to do. It's nothing more boring than somebody listening just to, listen, to talk about it. what does it sound like. And that's, that's the theme that's going to run through my presentation this afternoon. It is a great honor and a pleasure to be here and to be given the opportunity to speak to you all today. I am blessed to have been awarded the two research fellows, fellowships here at the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, the Naked Carpenter Fellowship, and of August 2014, and to be back here this fall as a Dietrich Reinhardt Fellow. And I must say that I've never experienced such a peaceful environment, and one so conducive to productivity here at St. John's Abbey. It's, I'm going to get a rude awakening when I go back home. I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted to report that during my stays here, I managed to complete the project begun here last summer, that is, the draft of a large monograph. And not, and not only that, but I've laid the groundwork for several additional studies that will keep me busy and have missed it for years to come. My talk this afternoon is about music, so it's particularly appropriate to hear some. We'll first hear more Byzantine chant, this time reconstruction of a chant for Tuesday and Holy Week from the 12th century. This will be followed without a break by a contemporary work by a Bulgarian composer, Lilia Tsenova, uh, one of her four militi, or prayers. And it's likely that this is the first time this music has been heard here in the United States. 
And the one we've chosen, I think, is particularly appropriate. It's called the Prayer for the Holy Cross, and it's performed by Anna Levy. So let's start, first of all, back in the 12th century, and then we'll jump to the 20th. And I will try to make the reasons for this choice clear at the end of my talk. Just to say, though, that both works come from the same milieu. They have more in common than not. I mean, the big difference is in the musical language. And that the operative behind both is ritual.
very bad. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> challenges for me, the presenter, performer, <laughs> and for you, the audience, we may require you to make the quantum leap. That is because anything to do with the medieval Slavic world is pretty much terra incognita to Western audiences, especially for those who work in mainstream medieval studies. We may attribute this, until now at least, to difficult to access primary source material, linguistic, cultural, and political barriers. Not to mention the polite indifference or even complacency within Western academic circles, and the passivity of its members to consider anything outside their immediate spheres of interest. And even within the field of Byzantine studies, of which this is part, the music plays only a tangential role, though worship in the Eastern Church would be inconceivable without it. I would like you all to leave here today, this afternoon, with the image of something rare, rather strange, wonderful, <clears throat> perplexing, definitely, and very special in your minds, eyes, and ears. And as you've already heard, music will frame and punctuate this presentation. So I'd like to begin with the basic definition of chant in the Eastern and Western churches. Plain song, heightened prayer, epitomized the Middle Ages musically. Like monasticism, the medieval period was its golden age. It adorned worship throughout the Christian world, in the Greek East and in the Latin West, where it formed the foundation of the entire Western European musical system. You cannot go through a musical program without learning about Gregorian chant. So it should be. I like to think, and we can't speak, of a single body of playing song throughout this period, sharing common principles of composition, modality, and function, within which existed a variety of dialects Dialects distinguished by language and differentiated by liturgical practice, but were unified by a common function to adorn worship. The text and music for the divine services were conceived holistically. In a unified process, the former was the progenitor of the latter. Text and music were conceived to fit like fingers in a glove. Liturgical infrastructure provided the framework, underpinning and supporting the text and music and in the unified form. Chant composition was a pattern-based process. Its composers were not anonymous. The poet, the creator of sacred verse, and the musician were one and the same. This is very pretty much a medieval tradition. Whether an adaptation of scripture, a translation from the Greek, or an original creation, the poet fashioned the music to seamlessly fit the syllabication of the text. Nor was chant a rhythm, its rhythm derived from the language and from the structure of the verse. And although chant is unmeasured, we certainly can't march to chant, the ebb and flow of the sacred verse set determined its metrical organization. Above all, the comprehension of text, <clears throat> when rendered musically, was paramount. The accentuation of the language in, in which a chant was set determined its execution. Chant, therefore, cannot be studied alone, but only in the context of those texts and the services to which it was integral. One must, therefore, take an interdisciplinary approach and examine plain song through the prism of liturgy. It supported theology, history, and linguistics. Chant is a living tradition, and in the Eastern Church in particular, it is a living tradition to this day. It is sung in the vernacular. It had to be adaptable as it was passed down from one generation to the next. We can never know what it sounded like in the early days. The medieval period is best defined as one of oral traditions. A performance varied from center to center, where it absorbed the local mellows, the local flavor, color. And we, therefore, we can only speculate. Unfortunately, Eastern chant never developed the four-line staff as we see most Western chant written. Some very wise man by the name of Guido Durezzo thought said, how am I supposed to know how high or how low I'm going if something's floating around without the text? Eastern chant's script comprised of symbols. 
we call them news, said about the text. And its earliest written record, the oldest which date from the end of the 8th century, to which our studies are confined, served only as a mnemonic device for those who learn their material by its method, that is, by ear. As a result, the oldest manuscripts we cannot read. You'll see some of those in a while. In the Christian East, they only become readable from the end of the 12th century. For when you think of them in the broad scheme of things of chant development, that's late. And even then, with the advent of what we call in musical parlance, diastomy, when its melodic equivalent is written on the five-line staff, the results could never be sung in the manner in which they were transcribed. The Western music writing system being entirely unsuitable for musical performance. So you might ask, why study it? <laughs> a modern, if we accept that a modern staff transcription, you can imagine the five-line staff in which any music is written, produces only a melodic outline. Skeletos, as the Greeks call it, or simply skeleton, which in the words of the musicologist Peter Jeffrey, quote, is never performed as such, but always in an expanded, ornamented form that varies with each performance and social context. And I will, end a quote, and I will add its geographical locus and the cultural milieu as well. Moreover, if we succeed in reconstructing a chant from the old system, there's no consensus on how it should, be, should sound. Differences in inter interpretation are irreconcilable to this, to this day. There's no way, for example, in the Eastern Church you'll ever get the Greeks to accept how anybody else's interpretation of this T chant. Well, okay, fine. At the same time, we can, however, glimpse their performance through the careful study of surviving documents. Melodies were contoured to fit the syllabication of the text, as I've said, and each musical sign or new was used to construct a melody had a name that described its function. It's some idea. A function that was nuanced. These signs were used to musically sculpt or paint the text in a performance, and the singer was the craftsman. Furthermore, a performance was decorated by hand gesturing that we call hieronymy, a praxis often depicted in manuscripts by the image of a hand, from which the notation itself comes. You have this gesture of the text, as if he's painting the symbols, the melodic direction in the air. It took a lot of skill, a lot of practice. Now this afternoon I have the opportunity to share some of the fruits of my labors. And I've been exploring early Slavic sacred music traditions through what I like to call the mechanics of liturgy. That is, by an ex examination of non-musical sources from which I've been extracting musical information. The time frame is the particularly culturally rich form of the period of the 11th to the 15th centuries. Heavy days for the Slavs. I have attempted to reach back into history and address the fundamental questions of performance practice. What did it sound like? How and where did it begin? To find out, I've been digging into the liturgical documents to find out how select numbers were sung, where they appeared in the services, and who sang. So for today's lecture, I've selected a ritual, in particular ritual, to explore through its music, using its hymnody and its performance to cast light on and to track the changes in liturgical practices. Now, while nominally dependent on the Greek models they inherited, the Slav, Slavic liturgy and music I treated as autonomous and independent. And from the 9th century on, they were. They share principles of the Greeks, but from that time on, they were doing their own thing. Why Slavic? Two reasons. It is the tradition to which I was first introduced in Nopez. Secondly, from an entirely musical perspective, the Slavic manuscript tradition, which is notoriously conservative, preserving the texts and the music like the Holy Writ itself, they preserve the oldest readings of the Byzantine chant. You want to know what was going on way back when you look at the Slavic manuscripts? In many instances, Slavic manuscripts antedate the Greek, 
It's like saying the copy is older than the original. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> As a musician, my interests lie with musical function and performance practice. How are they used? Where in the services? To what tradition do they belong? Cathedral or monastery? And under which liturgical authority? Concerning a modus operandi, determining the place and the time and con connection. That's my title. You heard Slavic Orthodox, that is a mouthful. Refers specifically to those lands and peoples who speak a Slavic tongue and who embraced the Christianity of the Greeks in the ninth century. Its birthplace was southwestern Macedonia, a place where today three borders actually intersect around three lakes. Macedonia, Greece, and Albania. The people were the heirs to the Mor Moravian missions <coughs> in Cyril and Soviet, who answered the call from the Moravian king in the 9th century for the services to be rendered in the language they could understand. The territories of Slavic Orthodoxia include the southern and eastern Slavic lands, specifically the Bulgarians, Macedonians, the, the Serbs, Bit of the math there. And all of Russia. As history has shown, borders were fluid and porous. And for a time the label also applied to culturally to the culturally and linguistically disparate Albania, Romania, and Hungary. I was reminded by a Romanian colleague when I was speaking on Slavic Orthodoxy, says, don't forget, we were part of that world too. The Christian baptism, that monumental event, marked their beginnings. It is imprinted on their collective consciousness and where it remains to this day. The full absorption of Orthodox ritualism gave form and content to Slavic society. Specifically, it stimulated and fostered tremendous literary activity in the form of translation of the sacred text from the Greek and, from very early on, the creation of original literary composition. From the Byzantines, whose mandate was to foster cultural pluralism in those lands they entered, by incorporating and absorbing the indigenous customs, they the Slavs received the tools of literacy, that is, in the form of an alphabet and a grammar for translation, along with all the trappings of the sacred rituals, including the music. The musical settings of the translated text were syncretically adapted to the melody of speech. Hang on to that one. Or the newly minted Slavic tongue. In other words, chant development was tied to that spread of literacy, the creation of a written Slavic language, and the establishment on the whole of a national identity and a historical consciousness. Now, the shared liturgical observances I'll well, try and flash this out a bit. During this time frame, however, cover a far larger geographical territory, stretching from, actually, from the Italian Greek cloisters of Grotta Ferrata in Rome. You see, Grotta Ferrata is down from somewhere in the south of the big circle of Rome. It's not too sharp. And Messina in the boot of Italy, Sicily, through the Balkans and reaching up along Russia's kiev Novgorod corridor, which are actually the farthest points north of Byzantine influence. With Constantinople as the model, all ecclesiastical centers within these territories, these regions, possess what, we, what I like to call as the requisite urban landscape, a city topography that included a central cathedral, as focal point for the community. Adjacent or nearby a large monastery, both of which were served by the same liturgical ordinal. Indeed, processions, we take as a specific example, of which there were many, and were a defining feature of the time involving these entire communities, as in Constantinople. As Robert Taft writes, the medieval liturgy was full of ritual comings and goings, would have moved between these large institutions on festive something kind of marked to define the area. For example, here's a, a medieval map of the area of, the, of medieval Nogod. 
the Kremlin, or what it was called in their language, Detians. Slightly sharper. The old walled city, and you see off to the to the right there what would be <coughs> the central cathedral. Here's a modern picture. It's modern because there's cars. <laughs> Aerial photograph of Mother, the medieval city, with the large cathedral of San Sofia, from which rituals would begin and move to a nearby monastery. This is the largest monastic establishment of slightly outside the city, as I understand it, the Yuria or St. George's Monastery. For the Slavs, these centuries were marked by historical upheavals across their lands and their ongoing struggle for political and ecclesiastical autonomy, and that all-important assertion of cultural identity. This was a period of transition, a time with, that witnessed the last flowering of the archaic rituals they received from Byzantium against the backdrop of imminent change. The Slavic lands were a bastion for the old rituals. A time of intersection between the established old and incoming new. The church witnessed the all important confluence of two great liturgical traditions. This is a reference to my title Constantinople and Emergent Jerusalem. Now, to this point, the Eastern Church defined itself liturgically by maintaining a distinction in their liturgical observances between urban churches and cathedrals and the monasteries. But from the late 11th century, this distinction between them was becoming progressively blurred. Three liturgical ordinals, ordinals, ordos, the Book of Rubrics, the Book of Instructions, which we call in the Eastern Church the Typicon, uh, which determined the service by for ascendancy from this time up through the 14th century. <coughs> These were the typicon of the great church, of Hagia Sophia, that book that preserved the cathedral offices, the all chanted numbers. And I'm reminded again of Father Taft telling me, he says, what's so great about it? We don't have any copies. <laughs> the typicon of Alexis the Studite, this is the one that dominated this time practice. It was, it was um, a hybrid book that melded cathedral and monastic elements then in concurrent use, and, and used Taft's words again, he calls it a mongrel. And the Jerusalem, or neo sabaitic typical, which is largely a monastic book, but a form of which is used to this day in the Orthodox churches. Each generated its own orbit of circus books, including musical manuscripts. Music was the barometer for determining which ordinal was in use in a given ecclesiastical center at a particular time. In this regard, the chant held a mirror to the past, and its application, a measure of the reforms to come. Placement, labeling, and the rendering of, of, a hymn, of the hymnody were indicators how a particular hymn was designated in the manuscript, and by whom it was sung, de sung determined its function and its place in the services. While many of our manuscripts are late, such indicators in form of older practices and traditions still in use. What on earth then were the Slavs singing in their churches and monasteries? Let's hear a little bit more here.
roughly from the end of the 14th century, is what we call an ex-apostolarian chant, a, church, a chant that's sung during the morning office. And this particular one, titled In the Chrysophonic Language, Potable Snow, or Flesh Who Has Fallen Asleep, is for Easter. It was sung by an ensemble, a um, contemporary Bulgarian ensemble, called the John Kukazel Angel Voice Choir. I think it's appropriate. Don't know how angelic we are. Alright, turning to my case study, time to get to specifics. As I put this example up, I'm remembering some comments made some weeks ago in a lecture given by Father Columba concerning wonderful act um, activities one can undertake during the vacation using the vehemel resources of learning Syriac geography. I said, well, why not learn some Slavic geography too? <laughs> The case study performance practice is enormous and controversial. To make it manageable, I've not only narrowed my focus to particular celebrations and zeroed in on specific numbers, I've, I've, I've zeroed in on these specific numbers, tracking them through a variety of sources compiled at different times and liturgical authorities. The example I've selected for illustration is particularly appropriate to this monastic setting. In an appendix, the calendar of liturgic comm commemorations in a 12th century copy of a Slavonic ordinal is an account of a popular musical ritual celebrated at table in Kiev's famous Monastery of the Caves that takes place, appropriately enough, at Easter. First observed in the 11th century during the time of its founder, Theodosius. The excerpt is given first in the original, then in English translation, and I won't make anybody read this giving instead an excerpt in English. It reads, At the end of the meal, before the serving of the sweet dish, that is, dessert, the agumen, that is the owl, gave a signal to the domesticus, the head singer. Next, having received from him a blessing, and according to his choice, he invited the best singer from among the monks. He stood on the highest step of the rostrum by the, the abbot of the agumen's table, and began to sing the chant melody of the Trapari. What's a Trapari? Think antiphon. At the same time, the domesticus went between the tables of the monks and selected a choir from them, which stood on the lower roster by the human, with the singers on the right side and on the left. And when the soloist, standing on the roster, sang the Kentakia, what's a Kentakia? It's a big hymnotic form Lots of verses, particular structure. The choir echoed its refrain. Then the domesticus and the soloist bowed to the human and went to the monastery treasurer, from whom they received monetary recompense. <laughs> they got paid. <laughs> Having received the blessing of silver, the domesticus stood in the middle of the choir and sang the first strophe of the cantatia, which the singers repeated. There's lots going on here. So let's start by asking some basic questions. Namely, what does this account tell us about sacred musical practices in early Slavic communities? Firstly, how the music was sung. The ex excerpt mentions A, responsorial singing of the festival Kentucky, that central hymn, and B, that it was re rendered as a refrain form. And by the way, we have manuscript evidence that using a refrain for this particular hymn type was very well known throughout the Eastern Church, and that the congregation of the faithful themselves used to sing the refrain. It mentions who. The quote mentions the singing personnel who include a soloist and a domesticus, a choir leader. The monastic brethren comprised the choir to sing the refrains. Maybe the abbot himself joined in. Where? The account describes the physical placement of the singers at the table in the refectory, according to rank, positioned on a platform below the human of the abbot's table, which was elevated to reflect the monastic hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So it gives a sense of, of what a, a Slavic monastery. This one's not elevated, but a refectory. This is from the Bachelor Monastery in southern Bulgaria. A very old establishment. 
and that the ensemble is divided half on the left and half on the right, so an antiphonal, antiphonal exchange of the hymn text, likely creating their formation in the church building for the service, according to the church ordinal. Where did this come from? Whence these traditions? Well, I figure the positioning of the singing personnel imitates the assembly of the patriarchal singers on the ambo of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Description for the accomplishment of festive occasions in the Byzantine capital be, can actually be found in a mid 10th century book called the Ceremonial Book of the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus. In Constantinople, quote, the singing was produced by organized choirs of singing singers which were called Hagia Sophia. Unquote. The singing was chiefly antiphonal and performed in rotation by two sides. Well, that's what we have here. Yet we're not in Hagia Sophia, but in a Russian monastery. The Byzantine account was obviously familiar, for it served as a template for our monastic practices. In the case of the case ritual, the monastic choir assembled on two sides of the table to carry out the singing. And we may interpret this as evidence of the successful transplantation and adaptation of Byzantine singing practices by a medieval Slavic monastic community with all its ritual dramatism. Now, what I read to you was just an excerpt, because it continues. A description continues with even more information. From the entry, continuation of the entry, we learn that the matronal festival, the Dormition of the Blessed Virgin Mary, August 15th, was celebrated in the same manner. I'll bring up. That's what it says there. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> It also mentions the singing of four principal chants for this feast and the number of times they were to be sung. Each one's actually sung three times. Now, here they are. There is the Festival Trapari and the Festival Antimon. There's the Festival Kentucky. Here's the continuation of the Kentucky. Lots of singing. And finally, this last one, the processional hymn. This last number, the processional hymn, has special instructions to, as to how it was to be sung. That is with hieronymi. It's pretty hard to read the sort of text there. That is that hand gesture we are conducting, likely accomplished by the domesticus, the head singer. This is exclusive evidence of the practice outside of the services. We're not in church, we're, in, we're at lunch. This is exclusive, and it is not mentioned anywhere else, neither in the rubrics for the feast, in any Greek or Slavic liturgical book. And Hieronymy, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, was essential, essential for a musical performance. Its practice was familiar to the medieval Slavs and attests to a high degree of musical sophistication and professionalism within the monastic community. And don't forget, the entry tells us that the singers were paid. What else? And there's more. Also referring to this particular numbers, number, in the margin of one of the manuscripts, which I had the great good fortune of examining a microfilm of it earlier this year, another manuscript that preserves this, that full description of the service is an entry is an intriguing rubric. A little fuzzy there. It actually says, O Kalyade. Now, Kalyata is a carol. And it might be the very first reference to a paraliturgical or non-liturgical use of hymnody in the Slavic lands and the beginning of a tradition that is caroling for a feast. <coughs> well, finally, when, in addition to Easter and the Feast of the Domitian, we learned the same ritual is carried out at Christmas and Epiphany, where it mentions the festival hymnody for these occasions. So what else do we have? The question I ask now is, do we have a score for the music, a notated score that we can read? The answer is an unequivocal yes to both. And while there are Slavic settings of the Kentucky with the feast from the 11th century, it is written in a script that we can't read. And what you're seeing here is one of medieval music's enduring mysteries, unsolved to this day. We do, however, 
have archaic Slavic versions of the transcribable Greek equivalents of that processional hymn that we can use to recreate the musical score. They are preserved in a selection of 13th and 14th century manuscripts that are the musical exponents of that liturgical ordinal in use across this enormous territory from Novgorod in Russia. Can't read that either. Where Byzantine cathedral traditions flourish well beyond the 16th century to the Balkans. From the story, lots of quotes, lots of fun. An important ecclesiastical center. To Messina the source from which a transcription of this very hymn was made. And in addition to its widespread dissemination throughout a huge geographical area, the chronolo chronology of the source has mentioned this chance span a 400 year period. Now, something I've not done here because I want to give you all a break. If we were to tabulate these settings, set one above the other, the melodic patterns emerge and all match up. The unique setting from the Castorian manuscript This one, on the one on the right, records all those big, fun hand gestures, those graphic representations of the musical patterns for which this chant is constructed. To be as scrupulously faithful as possible to the Greek original, the Slavic adapters would have had the skill to adjust the melody to the different Slavic Slavonic translation, to preserve that melody of speech. Now, I've got the text, the original Greek, Here we are, this is the Greek. One line at a time. Follow by the slap. With the syllable counts. So if the Slavic transcriber of the hymn has the Greek beside him, he would try and match it as close as possible in terms of syllable count so that it would fit the pre existent melody. Some of it matches right up. Now, what on earth does it say? Does it read? Let's have an English translation. It should look familiar. A version of it is actually found on the wall of the, wall of the Stella Mars Chapel. Oops. That's it. <laughs> so, what can the hymnody tell us? How can the hymnody be a barometer for liturgical change? What does it tell us about the Slavs? The function, whether stational or sessional, whether you're walking around or sitting down, its place in the services and even how it was labeled were all indicators of the time period and what ordinal was in use at that time. Its label determined its function. This particular hymn serves as a great test piece and it's also a historical marker. I attract it to its beginnings and I can find it in the liturgical ordinal of the great church of Hagia Sophia where it served as a solemn processional chant for the Feast of the Dermission. The same hymn was sung for the celebrations of the birth of the Virgin Mary on September 8th and her presentation in the temple on November 22nd. Indeed, our Slavic musical manuscripts label it processional chant and it likely retained its stational function with them. Nevertheless, the winds of liturgical change were blowing through the Byzantine Commonwealth. As the 14th century approached and passed, so did the steady encroachment of those Jerusalem monastic practices, which were already present. The centrality of this hymn and others like it gradually diminished. It would transition to a sessional number at Matins, a function that its name change implies, typically, a term of Palestinian monastic origins meaning simply sessional hymn. And it is still found in the liturgical books to this present day for the Marian feast, where it is affixed in the morning office, but it is just read while sitting. How disappointing. 
Knowing the conditions under which music was sung provide the invaluable context for its use, which would certainly inform us its re uh, reconstruction for a particular time and place. The final chapter of my study would be to breathe some life back into these old musical bones and restore the dynamism, dynamism of medieval liturgy, so that we may once again experience what was heard across this vast territory. So to close, early Slavic culture, particularly in music, continues to be an irresistible draw for me. You may have wondered, though, this presentation has been about the nitty-gritty of liturgy and music of the medieval period. Why then are we opening and closing with music that is obviously modern? As I said at the beginning, this is a living tradition. Chant is living. Chant may change, but its function, its function in the churches and the society has not changed. What converted the Slavs to Christianity was a ritual, and all the trappings that go with it. So as a final point, the roots of ritualism, ritualism, one that melds both the Christian and the pagan, remember that Byzantine pluralism, descend deep and define Slavic culture that permeated and continue to underpin it to this day. The Russians have a wonderful word for this phenomenon, it's called pochvinichistva, which we can translate as meaning rooted in the soil. It is an apt description. Among the Slavs, their past is alive in the present. It exists in a place where linear time is suspended. Now, both composers whose works we are hearing, we've already heard one, were reaching deep into that soil of their cultural heritage, drawing on that ritualism and that old chant, and in doing so, were keeping alive something from their very beginnings. By its nature, music is temporal an experiential performed art, for that, after all, must be sung, played, and heard in order to exist, for it to exist. It must also have its place. So, to conclude my presentation today, we'll hear another work, this time by the contemporary Bulgarian composer Stefan Dragosinov, one of his huge integral, a work that draws on the medieval heritage, draws on the old chant, as well as something else from Slavic soil. <laughs>
Thank you. So thank you very much for that just wonderful way to end the day. I think we'll take the time for maybe one or two brief questions and then encourage conversation um, after we have a formal part of our program. So was that old church like that was the Russian version of old church of the yes. That's the form of the language as it existed in the 11th and 12th centuries. It's a language that has evolved over the centuries and throughout a manuscript tradition. It is still the church language. Yes, it is still it is still the official language in the among particularly in the Russian church to this day. Was the chant um, particularly in Sicily and Southern Italy able to have any long lasting influence on the development of the Western tradition at all? Interestingly, no. Um, the part of Italy where an Eastern Chan tradition flourished, um, we, have, we have particular centers, these are the, what we call the Italo Greek cloisters, and they were um, distinct and separate from, from the Western traditions at the time. Uh, they did continue it for a period from the 14th, 15th centuries and seem to have diminished. Although, uh, San Salvatore of Messina, the birthplace of this particular manuscript tradition, and Grotta Parata are certainly flourishing and are of the Catholic Church, most about Eastern Rite, as I as far as I know. Does the hand gesture, I don't know the word, Kironami. Kironami, I want to say Parata. No, that's okay. uh, does that exist in any form still today, anywhere? <coughs> It does, a particular, well, yes, it does. Um, it's a very complex process and almost an impractical one. It's very hard to have a church service with someone doing all that much hand gesturing. But the uh, tradition of chanting that we find in the Greek Orthodox Church nowadays is the, the singers are trained in the art. And it's used mostly, I would imagine, for pedagogical purposes, for learning, learning the patterns. But it's, uh, I think the whole process, the art of Euronomy, would be just too complicated to actually be used in a, uh, in a church service. Are there any YouTubes? I wouldn't be surprised there's everything out there. <laughs> How about your next year? <laughs> Was I waving my hands around when I was trying to remember? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that one manuscript from Thestorius, uh, actually, hieronomic gestures are recorded in the, um, in the uh, musical manuscripts, and they're usually written uh, below the, the main line of news in red. And we, uh, they're, they're, it's actually a form of musical shorthand, uh, which I would imagine was used by a head chanter who was conveying the musical uh, information to an ensemble. Whether he's actually doing that much gesticulating, I, I think it would be rather distracting in church somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, they are present in the manuscripts. They, but, well, it sounds like there's a, a, a remarkable kind of family resemblance to play between that and playing a theremin, where there's all this gesticulation, the combination of body movement and the production of music. It's, it's, a, it's basically kind of a, 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 a full physical workout. <laughs> yeah, yeah, playing a theremin, yes. In these manuscripts, how do we know that there's a drum? Is there some instruction that there's a drum? The drum is something that, was on, that only appeared in the manuscripts later on, though it was considered part of performance practice. It's just something that was extemporized. And does raise the question of the use of a drone in chant across the Christian world. There are performances nowadays of Gregorian chant with the with the drone underneath. Um, it's, it was just it's, because the medieval period is one of an oral tradition. 
there were, was probably even a lot more other musical vocal activities going on than just the mere singing of, of a single line of music. But it's part of uh, Eastern Church practice, uh, a bourdon, or in the, the Greek word is isokratina, where you have something, uh, a sustained pitch underneath, very much like a bagpipe. Uh, you use the word extemporaneous. I'm thinking of modern jazz. Uh, I have a daughter who performs jazz and I have seen her scores. It is just basically each pair, each yeah, uh, There's nothing but a chord written above B7, yes. A12, or whatever, you know, whatever. So the improv, the improvisation is understood. But it can never be recreated. No. Exactly as that way. As I say, it's, it, when um, there's a real disadvantage that we have when we try and reconstruct Eastern chant on the five line staff, there's no way we can put all the flesh on the bones. The singer learned, learned the craft of extemporizing on a given model. The Greeks to this day call it, um, they call it stenography, or they call it, uh, when, we render, when we render a transcript, it's what we call a synoptic transcript, which is giving you the bare bones, or they will, there's another word they use uh, for extemporizing. Um, yeah, exegetical, they call it an exegetical performance. So say, this sign, yes, I know if I were to write this sign out, it means we go up one note. But that sign, that ascent of one note is accompanied by all sorts of inflection, nuance. And some signs even uh, encapsulate up to a dozen notes, where it's just given that when you see that sign of the text, you wail on it. Craig, I want to thank you for filling in a major gap in my church history courses at the seminary. Thank you. I had no idea of this. This is a major silence in my education. It is for most of us, actually. <laughs> yes, and, and thank, I'm, I'm awestruck, and I have learned from you tonight and earlier, and thank you so much. It is a challenge for me to make this stuff even remotely understood. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. And let me do note that over at Humboldt we do have some thousands of Slavonic manuscripts digitized in the Ukraine and in Romania. And I'm just back from my first visit to Russia, in fact. And we're hopeful of doing some work there in the very future. So stay tuned. And did I hear you volunteer to create Slavonic paleography resources for B. Himmel? <laughs> That's what I heard. Did you hear that? Okay, right. So we'll look forward to further conversation about that. Thank you for coming today.